Hello, and welcome to the East Africa Business Podcast. I'm Sam Ploy, and I'm here on the continent to learn about the emerging business scene. I'll be interviewing startups, investors, and organizations who are all playing their part in helping the region develop and grow. And in doing this podcast, I'll be sharing with you the things I learned along the way. One of the things I found really interesting is how proven international business models are being applied in East Africa. Music streaming is one of these. In years gone by, people in Europe and the US would own CDs, but now stream through services like Spotify, which pays royalties to its artists, making music accessible to all. Martin, who started Mudundu, is doing this in East Africa, though it's a little different. We discuss the particulars of the African music market, the considerations in scaling their business, and what they look for in hiring talent. The room is a little echoey, so apologies in advance. However, I hope this doesn't detract from what is a very interesting conversation. So I'm here with Martin in a co-working space called Nairobi Garage, uh, in, which is also where the offices of Dundu are. Uh, Martin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. So just to get us started, can you tell us a bit about you and a bit about what Dundu does? Yeah, so um, a bit about myself, I'm Martin. Uh, I'm originally from Denmark. Uh, I moved here to Nairobi uh, just around uh, oh, just around four years four years ago, four and a few months. Um, that, that's basically about me. Uh, I came here with a, with a, with a small um, investment, seed investment fund, uh, which is completely private. Uh, they're looking to do a number of, invest- of investments in the tech industry across Africa. Um, I came here together with them uh, and uh, really kind of liked the environment. Uh, I really liked the opportunities that were here. I thought from a, I, yeah, from four, four or five years ago uh, in, in Europe, there's not a lot of fun. Uh, happening and uh, there's not kind of I think I think yeah, everything was kind of in a bit of a slowdown and so I felt like why not spend my time and my kind of uh, early career uh, starting up a business and trying to start a business in in, in Africa or in Kenya for this for this matter. Um, a bit about Abdundo. Uh, well, so Abdundo is a music service. Um, we basically it started as an idea uh, just briefly after I moved here, so in, uh, towards the end of 2012. And we, together, together with a few colleagues, um, we were basically just discussing uh, the music industry here in, in Kenya. We were meeting with a few of the different uh, stakeholders, musicians, uh, different uh, uh, music lovers, um, and just genuinely found out that the solutions that were currently provided were not very good. Uh, there was a big, uh, most of the parties that we talked to were, on site were not very happy. So uh, the musicians were not happy. There's no easy way to find music. There's kind of, a big, as we see, a big gap in the market. Um, we didn't really have an idea how we were going to solve it, but we felt like let's, let's see if we can give it a try and, and, and find a solution that can satisfy the different partners involved. So, uh, so what is the current solution? Yeah, so um, for, for just kind of to stay a little bit step back for a year or so, we kind of just tried around different things, and today uh, the solution is. Um, I kind of like to explain it like very similar to Spotify in terms of philosophy. So basically the solution that we're providing here is technically and kind of operationally quite different, but the philosophy that we're going into the industry with is very similar to Spotify, which basically means that we're looking for a way to make it easy for, um, uh, to make to make it easy for people and affordable for people to um, access music. And with a philosophy of that we want people to go from um, illegal sites into legal sites, and then try and monetize the channel between the artists and their fans. Um, so that's kind of in a nutshell what we do. And where the market is significantly different from Europe is especially around licensing. Um, there's no record labels here. The music market is very fragmented. And if you want to kind of get all music together and kind of get everything together, uh, you need to um, work with a lot of individual parties. And that might be hard to do in a scalable way. So our solution is basically a platform where musicians can um, can sign up and upload their music by themselves. They can control their music rights uh, as individuals. Um, so for them, the experience is actually very much like uh, being a, a, a YouTube contributor, but just for audio. And then the front-end solution to the, to the fans is, as I said before, very similar to a Spotify solution where you can go in and listen to some music for free, uh, funded by advertisement, um, which you also pay uh, royalties off. And then a, a premium tier for um, the higher end users who uh, are willing to, to to spend money on music. Um, so why was Spotify here? Yeah. So um, well, I think why why I'm Spotify not here? Why a lot of music services not here? And um, well, the main thing is the licensing structure. 
So if you want to go here and license uh, music, there's not really anyone who can provide you with that license. So you can obviously come here, Pisa, for example, which is, the, I think, one of the closest uh, uh, competitors to Spotify that's French-based. Uh, they are here, as if their service is live. They're not physically actually based here. But you can actually go and open the, the, the application and listen to their music. But all the content is the international license catalog. It's not a local catalog, so you can't listen to your Kenyan songs, your Ugandan songs, your Tanzanian songs, and so on. And so that's one of the biggest barriers of entry for international music services to actually get hold of this unique local catalog that is uh, highly consumed. Um, and I, uh, yeah, to kind of add to that, in, in many in many markets uh, and many uh, where, where where music services have kind of grown out to, uh, the music industry has realized as as much as it's um, very, like global hits are very, very big. And if you have a global song, it will be played all over. But there's a big percentage of the consumption of the individual listener that is actually local. And so if you can't satisfy those needs, it, it's very hard for you to actually buy um, a, a solution, but the, a kind of a sticky solution for the user. Do you have an idea of why there are record labels here? Yes. Um, well, I think. It's the kind of solution to why there's a lot of things missing here. Uh, it's, it has a combination of the, the general state of the market, so the different market factors that are here. I think obviously financial and economic status is one of them. Um, if you were to go in and actually invest in Catalog, for example, what is the return on investment going to be? Um, I think, I do think there's a potential of having record labels here, but I, it, record labels is in the first place a bit of a tricky business. Um, but if I was to go out, even with four years of kind of data and experience in the music industry here, I don't think I would go in and buy any particular recordings and thinking I would make a return on it. Uh, I think where there is a potential in the music industry is particularly in the uh, in the live scene, and there's starting to be some brand endorsements, live shows, concerts, those kind of things are starting to pick up, merchandising, uh, video content is getting monetized quite well. Uh, but in, in, in regards to actually uh, Sitting as a, as a as a company and actually buying up rights and making a return on investment on those recordings, I, I don't think it's, it's still it's still early days. Um, but the record labels are moving a little bit around here. Uh, you have uh, Universal has, uh, uh, has kind of uh, is, is interested in opening new uh, offices here. Uh, Sony has opened offices in Nigeria recently and wants to open here as well. It's kind of popularly known. Um, so there is there is activity. It's just moving. Like as, as any other industry, it's, it's moving a little better over here. And just in, in simple terms, how does a record label make money? Um, well, so again, it depends on the different how, how the record label look. Um, I think uh, most of the record labels that we understand, so the biggest labels in the world, so Universal and so on, is basically a return on investment on the recordings. So they'll go out and say, okay, we are buying these recordings for this amount of money, and when we distribute this music, uh, or monetize the channels that we can around this music, so that can be uh, it, it, it's very specific from recording to recording what kind of rights they'll have. Um, but let's say they, um, well, let's set it on Spotify, but in Dramana, that will be a revenue stream. Yeah? That's basically how it works. So it's the, the yeah, buy, buy the song and then look to sell it in various different ways and take a cut. That's yeah. the simple form. But yeah. there's, a, there's a, a various individual negotiating contracts with individual artists, so that's kind of that's a little bit tricky. Is that, I remember. Well, hearing, you know, there's there's always someone in the news like the Taylor Swift who what didn't want her stuff on Spotify. Yeah. Have you felt any resistance from local musicians? Well, we have. And I think um, most of it is highly because of uh, trust. So we're seeing that as we're building our brand uh, stronger and stronger, the start also starts also to make to make more and more sense for them. I think musicians here are kind of a one man record label. So we'll find um, Musicians have a kind of their own business, and they're trying to find different ways of monetizing their brand. And for most of them, uh, those channels that are working out for them, is, as I said before, is live shows. It could be a bit of uh, brand endorsements. It could be a bit of merchandising and so on, but primarily live shows. The money that they make back on distribution is fairly little. There is some kind of distribution channels that are working for them, uh, such as uh, ringback tunes, which is quite big here, called ringback tunes. That's basically when you... Uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, uh, as a as a mobile subscriber, you can uh, subscribe to a ringback tune, which basically means when someone calls you, it plays some famous song instead of the normal ringing tone. 
Yeah? And that is a really big product here. Um, I think there's 10 million subscribers paying like 1 million shilling a day. Uh, so quite a big business here. And they make a lot of money. Um, but it's kind of a, it's not a product that allows for a lot of browsing or music. It kind of allows only for a limited number of songs to be, to be available. Um, but that is quite a big uh, way for the musician to make, to make a return on investment on their recordings. Um, but in terms of the kind of distribution that we're otherwise used to, uh, there's not uh, really, and there hasn't been any way for them to actually, just to actually monetize that since the last 15, 20 years. Uh, it's mostly been pirated, uh, just available for free online. And so that, in this case, when we meet artists here, it's more because they don't really understand, or they don't really see how this will ever become a significant revenue stream for them. So the time invested in working with someone like us is just not worth it because the return on investment is not going to be there. And as we have grown across countries, we are seeing a lot more interest because out of a sudden we don't become only a revenue partner, but also a marketing partner. So for example, you'll find a musician in Kenya who is interested in branching into the Ugandan market or Tanzania market or the other way around. And then we become a more, um, a, a, a bigger partner and the time invested in working with us uh, becomes worth it. So, how many countries are you operating? So, the music service uh, that we're running is available all over, so you can access it from all over the world. Um, in terms of uh, music, we have uh, we work with 20,000 musicians from uh, 37 different African countries. But in terms of actually physical presence, we're only in three here in, in Kenya and in Tanzania and in Uganda. Uh, we are quite ambitious towards getting into other markets and moving forward. Um, we have a very strong belief that if uh, our business is, is currently not a profitable business, if we want to turn it profitable, it really depends on the, our, our ability to scale across 10, 15, 20 African markets, um, where we start seeing these synergies between the different markets uh, and can reach a critical uh, number of, of, uh, of users. Um, so, so we have always been with the mentality of that we want to grow to as many markets as possible. Um, in, in sort of rough numbers, what are your current user base and what is what do you consider critical mass? Well, so we're currently running uh, a million active users a month. Um, I think uh, when we get to around 10, 10 million, it starts becoming uh, something that's very interesting. Um, not only uh, from a profitability perspective, but also from a perspective of contributing back to the music industry. So I think that is the critical mass number we're actually looking at. The critical mass number is the, is the point, at, at a big point, at which point can we go out and say, okay, we are actually contributing significantly back to the music industry and become a significant revenue stream for the musicians that we are working with, so that it, that motivation around why why should I work with a window starts making sense. Um, and someone can actually make money back on the recording from our site. Uh, that is of, from our service. That is when it starts becoming critical. And right now, uh, yeah, five to ten doubling our numbers, and we'll do that. Um, what uh, I mean, is, is it easy for you to get users, or like, what's the um, yeah, what, what's the sort of process by which you, you onboard a user or you get a user? I would say it's relatively easy. Um, like, I think growing a business is never easy, and building a business is never easy. But I think the, 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 for us, when we have when we get the catalog on board. Growing the user base is fairly, fairly straightforward because most of the content that we onboard is uh, actively being looked for online. So we find a lot of traffic just coming through Google search, uh, just coming from social media. So if a musician has uploaded a new song to our site, he shares it to his fans and people find us. So the acquisition cost of users is actually fairly low. Um, as long as we get the catalog on board, the kind of the rest of the mechanism kind of works out fairly, fairly straightforward. So that has been quite easy for us. Um, the issue is uh, what happens if you cannot deliver the content. So um, as, a, as a music service, you, you're always striving to uh, not have, um, if any, as, many, as, as few as possible holes in your catalog. You don't want to have a song that you don't have. Because what happens as soon as uh, a user uh, is looking for a song that they can't find, they'll switch back to an illegal site or back to uh, ripping it off YouTube or somewhere else. Uh, and you've lost that customer because it's like, okay, that was not, my, my convenience was not worth it. And so you are, you're constantly fighting against the catalog from pirated sites, which are basically uh, always, in, in many cases, superior because they don't follow the rules. Um, and so you are striving to make sure that you actually 
onboard all the content and have all the content as well that the users to find. So that's the biggest challenge. And when, that, when we get the content, the users come as well. Um, how much does it cost for a user? Oh, sorry, how, much, sorry, how much does the user pay? Yeah. So the, the service is um, free. So there's a premium model. So there's a free tier. There is a, fee, a paid tier, but you pay uh, $2 a month. So a fairly a significantly smaller fee than when you pay for international services. Um, obviously, we also only uh, offer a local catalog, so a smaller catalog than what they do. Uh, and also, the, the income level is, is different, different here from, from, from the West. Um, so for $2 a month, you can access the full, the full service with no advertisement and kind of offline and the whole, the whole thing. Uh, how many songs do you have? We look at 20,000 musicians, um, and I think they have, they all together have approximately 60 to 70,000 songs um, across the catalog from, from, across the, from across the continent. What's your favorite song from Modern My favorite song? Oh, it's, it changes a lot. I think uh, it kind of depends on, on, depends on what kind of mood I'm in. Uh, recently, I've heard a lot of um, a, a band called, there's a, there's, a, there's a group here called Just a Band. And they actually have quite a lot of success in Europe as well. Uh, do a lot of shows in Europe. And they have this kind of Afrobeat, uh, Afrofusion, um, kind of combined in a place that can also play in, uh, in more of a kind of, I don't know how to explain it. Just check it out, maybe. Just so, check it out. I'll, I'll, I'll add it to the show notes. Yeah. So people, so people can yeah, yeah, yeah. They're really, really cool. And I think also one of the reasons why I like it is they do appeal more to the European ears than many of the other, the other music. So that's probably also why I like it. And then they're amazing. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, what, what is the typical demographic of a listener of the new? Very interesting question, actually. Um, it has changed a lot since we started. So it's very funny. It's been very funny for us. Um, we basically started having a very young demographic, so 18 to 24, um, a little bit more guys than girls, a little bit more urban than rural. Um, but what we have seen with Kenya is that over the last year and a half, it has heavily shifted to also include an older generation. So we're seeing, um, I think, age group above 35 years uh, accounts for 30% of our traffic now, which is kind of a big jump, especially when you look at the demographics of the general population, which is heavily skewed towards I think half the population is below the age of 18, or something like that. So it's a really young population in, in Kenya. Um, but also quite exciting because I think it shows that Kenya's, Kenya kind of across, across, uh, across age groups are uh, very easily, uh, very easily uh, adoptable to, to new technology and to new things. Um, it takes a bit more time, obviously, than the early adopters, but they'll get there. Um, in Uganda, it's a similar trend. In Tanzania, we have primarily young. And very young people, but I think also it's just a matter of time, and it also kind of start uh, going across the different different generations. And how are people listening to the music? So that's actually also an interesting question. So we we allow people to do streaming and to download download the music. Um, kind of going back to what I said in the very beginning, we have always gone in with the philosophy. A uh, very similar philosophy as, as, as Spotify, which basically is that we need to make sure that people access music from our side instead of access music from illegal sites. And so that term access to music um, has, has a different meaning here than what it has in the West. So access to music in, in Denmark, where I'm from, can just be being able to stream the music because uh, everyone has a good internet connection, they, everyone has a good device to actually access the music. And so we've had a number of conversations about okay, what does access to music mean here? And so when we just started, it was actually just an MP3 download. So you could just download an MP3 from our website, uh, and you could uh, you could even share it with friends. There's no really protection of copyrights. Um, it was very easy. Uh, it was it was not extremely well protected and not inside an application or anything. But we meant, we were kind of thinking this is the only way for us to act, to give the broader audience access to music. That has a little bit changed since then, because we, we do see a lot of people using Android devices now. So we're pushing a lot more for Android apps, which allows us to control the music after it's been downloaded. Uh, this is inside the app. Um, we also have uh, launched streaming earlier this year, which has uh, really blown our, our minds. Uh, streaming is really picking up fast and taking away uh, traffic from downloads. Basically, our mentality was that downloads would be better, because a download um, only costs data consumption once. So in, in Kenya, uh, current data and access to, to internet is a currency. 
everyone will know how exactly how many megabytes they have a day to spend. So if they spend three and a half megabytes on downloading a song, that's three and a half megabytes. They don't have to go on Facebook or to check email or to whatever else it is. So it kind of works like a currency. And so therefore, we were like, okay, download is the best way to do it. Um, but since then, we have actually seen a, a shift, and I think it's only a matter of time before uh, the force streaming will like, be the same kind of way you consume, actually, you're consuming in, in, uh, in global products, yeah, Tesla, Spotify, and Apple Music, and so on, where it's, it's primarily streaming, um, uh, possibly streaming with a little bit of offline functionality as well. Uh, but it's basically, we, we, are, we basically follow the market and we're just dictated by what allows us to reach masses. So why are people suddenly starting streaming? These are costs. So the cost of uh, internet has gone down significantly. Uh, here in Kenya, it's been cut by three, in, 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 by, yeah, cut in a third, I think, from a year ago, a year and a half. Uh, competition around telcos uh, has really cut it down. Some different initiatives are lowering data prices. I think also some of the telcos are realizing that if they want to start uh, making money on data, they also need to branch it out and even more people to use data. There's kind of a, a balance between those two. Um, obviously, you can you can keep the data cost high, but you'll only reach 10% or 5% of the population uh, at a premium, but you're better off getting the whole continent, uh, the whole country on board. Um, so data prices is the number one thing. And internet speed as well. Um, what does Mudindi mean? Mudindo is a Swahili word. Uh, it means beat or rhythm. Uh, I think as far as why it can both be used as a as a as a verb and as a as be be the source we have. Feel feel the rhythm is also is also uh is also the understanding of the rhythm. Um we kind of we kind of came up with it when we just started and it was actually a very a very interesting process. Um I I was kind of just considering a name to the service. We'd actually launched the service without a name uh, because we've we just wanted to kind of test the waters. We just got on board with it and started getting some traction. And then um, at some point, we needed to get a name to the project. And I, I kind of just, I had just been here for two or three months. I didn't know any Swahili. And started writing a list of um, of English words that is related to music. So everything from beat to play to all these kind of stream uh, combination of, of the different English words. So okay, what, 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 what words are music like? And then I got someone to translate it for me. And then in Brindle, I found like it, 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 was, it sounded like a good brand name. I thought it would work outside of Swahili talking countries as well. And, and the domain was available. So uh, just go ahead. Nice. Um, what are you most looking forward to in the next six months in a Mudundu perspective? Yeah, um, well, both six and 12 months, uh, we, we are just in a very interesting position where we have, we have seen very good growth the last nine months. And we have been extremely happy with our expansion to Uganda and Tanzania, which started nine months ago, seven months ago. Uh, and so we just want to duplicate that. Now we're ready. Um, so it's a lot about scaling, scaling the business up, getting into more countries, getting more positions on board, uh, trying to find strategic partners across markets who are interested in working with someone like us, um, and just kind of try and, um, as I said, uh, increase the value of the music industry as a whole by taking control of this relationship between the artist and the users. When you look at um, how you scale across different countries, uh, what are sort of the key lessons you've learned and the key things you're going to be thinking, right, we need to make sure we do this? Yeah. Well, as I said before, content is key here. So it's all about signing up the content that is, uh, is needed. If you don't have the, the top 50 artists in the country uh, or the top 50 of the top 100, um, then there's nothing for the user to, to listen to. So our, our strategy is very much to make sure we get the right content on board um, as soon as we can. Um, otherwise, I think key lessons from us in terms of uh, growth across, the, across, across um, new markets is to find uh, the right people. So when I say right people, it's basically those countries where you hired, hired young, entrepreneurial, uh, hungry uh, people, for, 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 for quite low cost as well. Those are the countries that have been succeeding for us uh, and the process that's succeeding for us. Whereas getting um, someone who's more experienced um, has not had a lot of, like they, 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 are, they are either, um, they are either uh, not, not hungry enough for actually driving, driving results and not entrepreneurial enough, or they don't really have 
they're a bit too stuck in the way that uh, they're looking at how uh, the world is currently looking, whereas we're trying to create something that's not existing. So finding someone with a lot of experience and going and tell them, yeah, we're doing something completely new has been a bit of a challenge. Um, even if you tell them, okay, we're just, we're just doing like Spotify, well, if you don't know Spotify, it's a bit hard uh, to kind of explain, explain that. So I think for us, that has been uh, the winning strategy, find really entrepreneurial, hungry young people who just want to, to make a change. How do you find these people? We have primarily used networks. Uh, so that kind of, there's always someone who knows someone uh, in that country, and that kind of helps us branch out. Uh, I think here in Nairobi, as, as you were saying in the beginning, we're sitting in a co-working space. So that means that uh, there's probably 20 other companies sitting around us. And kind of together, everyone has a network and can kind of help branch out. So in the other countries, we have tried to look for similar spaces. Uh, because that helps us not only find an office space that is fairly affordable and, and, and easy to, to set up, um, but also help us grow, uh, help, us, help, help give us, giving us access to a local network. Um, if you send an email around in, in, in Nairobi startup garage and say, yeah, we're introducing this person, you will very easily get applications. Uh, but we also use more kind of uh, global solutions, LinkedIn, uh, kind of LinkedIn job posts, those kind of things works as well. And when you get somebody to come into the office or you do the interview, is there a sort of a, sort of a question or is there a, a trait that you're like, oh, if this person says, <clears throat> says this, then they're high? Mm. Not in particular. Um, I think I think that's not really how we uh, how we look at it. We look at more of like a, a rounded profile. Uh, how's the uh, how's the person playing on, on, on different tangents? I think, as I said before, what what really matters is that you get someone who's very uh, entrepreneurial and and this, because because in most countries we go into the person more by themselves. Maybe there are two, maybe there are three people. Uh, but in, in a tech business, a big part of the operation is tech, and that's kind of sitting at the same place and doesn't really move around unless you're scaling. Um, so in that case, um, it, it is important that you have someone who's self-driven and can be sitting by themselves. So it's more kind of previous demonstration of that. Uh, I think having obviously a, a network on an inside in the music industry also helps uh, for, for onboarding content, but just kind of entrepreneurial and kind of uh, yeah, hungry, hungry to, to, to prove themselves right. And so how big is the Lulu team currently? So we are 15 people, uh, spread across uh, three countries, and actually we have two guys in Europe, the, the tech, two, two tech people sitting in Europe, so the, an Android developer and, uh, and a CTO sitting in Europe. We have uh, 10 people here in Kenya, one in Uganda, and two in Tanzania. And then what's been the biggest surprise that you've found since you started? The biggest surprise? Well, no, it's obviously not great to... Uh, um, what, what, what the surprise is there? I think, oh yeah, actually the biggest surprise is how much music is being produced and how much music is very well produced and very easy to listen to out of East Africa that is never hitting any mainstream media ears or anything. So basically if I flip through our catalog, I'll find hundreds and hundreds of songs where the music, like it's, a, it's good uh, handcraft, yeah? like good music, well played guitar, well singing, well songwriting, well produced, um, but the passion is not is not out there. Like you don't actually. We have we worked with with, with yes, eight thousand eight thousand musicians just in Kenya. There's an insane amount of people uh, creating music, and majority of the main way of distributing music here is through radio. And radio can't play that many artists. They kind of have to stick to the top fifty that rotates around and around and around. So. Just kind of, I have, I have been very surprised about how much good content is coming out of here, and, and I think uh, in the years to come, that will also come to, to, to the benefits of our platform like our own. Uh, so we'll just ask a few more questions. Yeah. That's okay. Um, when you sort of look forward three years, five years, um, what does Bolivia look like? Three years, four years. Well, so in, I think one thing I've learned about uh, having a small company or a startup in, in such a fast-moving market as, as, as Kenya is, um, is that three years and five years is very far <laughs> in the future, and many things can change. Um, I think, let me just kind of give, draw a picture of how it looks when, when I think it's, it's mature and it's ready, and that could take three years or five years. Um, it could also take less. Basically, Mdundo is a, music, a service that connects uh, Africans 
to music. And so that music can be both um, locally, uh, continent, the, from around the continent, or globally. So basically giving him more access to this catalog of music that's out there, that you might or might not have listened to um, uh, before. Um, I think it's uh, going to be across a number of countries, and I hope that uh, that uh, continent-wide reach will help us um, generate, make, uh, generate value um, across the music industry, so not only in this music distribution, but in other uh, sections as well, and become a valuable partner for, uh, we talked about music labels before, valuable partner for music labels, musicians, uh, event organizers, and kind of just as a whole increase the total value of the music industry today. And is your risk that Spotify might just come and try and do that? Yeah, well, I think. Obviously, there's a risk. I think if you if you look at a, a market such as East Africa, uh, it's not very competitive. So even if a big player comes in, uh, there's, in my opinion, still plenty of room. Um, I think we have some unique uh, flexibility and some unique um, activities that we can play around with, and, and kind of makes us different from what they do. Uh, they kind of come with a global strategy and a global perspective, which is definitely appealing to some users, and we can uh, kind of find our own uh, our own market in India. Um, there's several dimensions, such as devices, uh, accessibility, internet costs, and so on, where we can position ourselves differently. And, uh, and how can people listen to How can they follow the story? Yeah, well, they should go down on our Android app. Uh, that would be the best. Uh, but you can just check out our website. It's not very uh, high-tech. It's a very low-tech website uh, because of the kind of uh, yeah, the market practice here. But if you want the best and kind of premium experience, get the, get the Android app. It's free. There's no sign up really required. And uh, try it out and, uh, and listen to some really cool African music. Including just the band. Including just the band and hundreds of others that are really, really good. Awesome. Cool. Well, Martin, thanks so much. You're welcome. Cheers. Before we head, just a quick moment to say thank you for listening. You can see the show notes of this episode by heading to samfloy.com forward slash podcast and then searching for the episode title. That's S-A-M-F-L-O-Y dot com forward slash podcast. Now, a few people have got in touch and have been asking about how this podcast came about. And well, it all started when I took a one-way flight to Rwanda to seek out business opportunities across the region. I'm now at the stage of formulating a bit of a plan of the business I want to go into based on all of these podcast interviews and will be keeping a record of what I get up to on my blog. And so if you're interested in being kept in the loop, you can sign up to the newsletter there. Again, it's samfloy.com. Also, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback about the podcast, or indeed anything, please feel free to email me, podcast at samfloy.com, and I'd be very happy to chat. In any case, have a great week, and speak to you soon.